Jackson is one of America's most brilliant social and political figures in the movement for justice and democracy. An author and activist, superb orator, politician and spiritual leader, Jesse Jackson has led or been a part of every major drive in America over the past generation for empowerment, peace, racial justice, gender equality, economic and social justice. Known around the world for his work in human rights and economic justice, the Reverend Jesse Jackson has been a pivotal figure in such international struggles as the anti-apartheid movement, the liberation of Angola, and self-determination movements in Latin America. Reverend Jackson's two presidential campaigns broke new ground in U.S. politics. His 1984 campaign won 3.5 million votes, registered over a million new voters, and helped the Democratic Party regain control of the Senate in 1986. His 1988 campaign won 7 million votes, and Reverend Jackson came in first or second in 46 out of 54 presidential contests. The Reverend Jackson has received many honors for his work in human rights and social justice. His commitment to the youth of America is outstanding. Mr. Jackson has been on the Gallup list of the 10 men most respected by Americans for the past decade. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to welcome the Reverend Jesse Jackson to Kansas State University. Let me express my thanks and delight at the privilege and the opportunity to share with you on this occasion. Let me express my thanks to the President who has uh, called personally to help organize this splendid opportunity to Mr. Reagan and the one who put the ultimate elbow in my side and offered me a deal I could not refuse with a not so subtle threat, Senator Katzenbaum. Won't you stand please again? <laughs> I mean, she never stops playing power politics. We were having a very critical television show some weeks ago on our CNN both sides of Jesse Jackson program and Senator Katzenbaum said I will come on the condition that he come to Kansas State and will not show up until he declares he will come. Promises made, promises kept. Let me say to the faculty and administrators and those of you who come from surrounding areas. It's a source of joy to be with you at this time in the history of our country as we seek to grapple with the critical issues of our time. I want those of you who are here, uh, young Americans, I call out to you to join in the Rainbow Crusade to heal and rebuild America, to stop the downward trend and threat of self-destructive behavior, to address the crime and violence condition that is now engulfing our nation. You hear this, if you will, violent crime and violence is tearing apart the fabric of our society. 
it seems to have gotten worse. It's worse than any other industrialized country in the world. It's drug related. It's turf related. Sometimes just random madness. Violent crime is tearing us apart. It seems to have had an even worse effect on young African-American males. But it's not just violence in the form of, of homicides, it's hunger affects more than 20 million Americans. About one in eight children under age 12 in our country suffer from hunger. One in 10 Americans now get food stamps. This country ranks 21st among industrialized nations in infant mortality. But the U.S. Conference of Mayors says the need is going unmet as malnutrition is on the rise again. In U.S. cities, people are being turned away because of a lack of resources. Nearly 200,000 people in the United States have been diagnosed with AIDS since 1981. Of those, 100,000 people have died already. The Center for Disease Control estimates that one million more Americans could be carrying the AIDS virus even as we speak. And more and more the victims have been and will be babies. Number one and number two sources of death and destruction, homicide, or fratricide, brothers and sisters killing brothers and sisters, are AIDS, often the result of, of unloving, unguarded, undisciplined sex, both of which are preventable forms of self-destructive behavior. Now, there are a number of high school students who are here this morning. I want to ask you several questions that those who may not be connected as indeed we ought might get a sense of why I choose to address this issue of violence and crime today. If you're in this room today, and you are 21 or under, and you know someone in your age group who is dead because of drugs, please stand. If you know someone who's dead because of drugs, wherever you are, please stand. Be seated. If you know someone in your age group who is in jail because of drugs, please stand. Be seated. If you know someone at your school who has tried drugs, please stand. <laughs> Be seated. If you know someone in your school who sells drugs, please stand. Be seated. If you know someone in your age group who has brought a gun to school, please stand. Be seated. Now be fair and honest on this one. If you have told some teacher or some principal or some pastor about who is selling drugs, in your school, or who has a gun in your school, stand. And so we hear somewhere between silence and a silly grin. It represents the code of silence. It makes you unwittingly a co-conspirator, a corroborator, almost a collaborator, in the growth of drugs and guns, which lends itself most directly to AIDS 
and crime and self-destruction. Your silence allows your school environment to be a sanctuary, an incubator for the development of the number one and number two threats to your lives, drugs and guns. By and large, the level of killing that we see is not nearly so much rooted in poverty as it is rooted in drugs and greed and mindless materialism. And so today I call us to meet to heal and rebuild our country. If it were a problem, we could quickly solve it. Problems can be solved quickly. Conditions which are the result of long ignored problems must be healed. And that which must be healed requires a, a spiritual foundation and more time and more resources. If you will to be a part of this crusade for moral and academic excellence, and to be a participant in this war against drugs and violence and crime and self-destructive behavior, let us stand and bow our heads in prayer. Have mercy on us. Forgive us for our sins and our foolish ways. Look deep within us and flash your illuminating light in the dark recesses of our souls. If you find anything that should not be in a hatred, a jealousy, a malice, a meanness, a greed, a racism, a sexism, a anti-Semitism, a anti-Arabism, a anti-Asianism, a homophobia. If you find any mean spirit that should not be, remove it and make us better and never bitter. Let something that is said or expressed here today transform somebody's lifestyle and alter their behavior they might be a factor for good to make the world more secure and our nation better. Bless this school and those who've come and those who accept the burden to enlighten the minds of our youth. This is our earnest petition and prayer. Amen. Choices and consequences. None of us can avoid the consequences of our choices. And so often even a non-choice is a choice and thus there is a consequence. In many instances your silence about that which threatens the moral fabric of our country Silence is a choice, and that choice has devastating consequences. Dr. King said to us over and over again, we must choose coexistence or co-annihilation, non-violence or non-existence. We have the choice to turn to each other and not on each other. Violence is a civilizational crisis. The cost, the fear, the facts are driving our national political priorities. A recent study in the Chicago Tribune of street gangs 
The study made these conclusions. Street gang patterns, trends, reflect not only chronic problems such as racial and class discrimination and adjustment of immigration, but also acute, often rapidly changing problems stemming from the existing economic situation, weapon availability, drug markets, the arrangements of street gang territories across the city. Obviously, the chronic problem of street gang violence cannot be solved with a quick fix. The ultimate solution rests on a coordinated criminal justice response, changes in educational opportunities, racial and ethnic attitudes, and job structure, close quote. The Congress must offer more than prisons. The President must offer more than platitudes. We must go beyond whereas the problem exists and now has deteriorated into a condition. Because it has been long ignored, we must now go from whereas we recognize it to therefore programs, plans, and priorities, power rightly used. In the face of our fear-driven politics, last year, earlier in the year, there was a, a vote down of an economic stimulus plan to put many young Americans back to work, provide them the option of hope. Somebody decided to save, to save a mere $16 billion to invest in our people. But now they're rushing to pass a $22 billion crime bill. The solution to the crisis that's projected is more police, not more teachers, more jails, not more schools. Stimulus defeated crime bill rolling. Fear, fear, fear. The reality is across our country today, plants are closing. Family farmers driven to assembly lines. Workers cannot get a fair wage. Farmers cannot get a fair price. Plants closing, jobs leaving tax base eroding, youth restless, aimless, school systems traumatized. And the crime bill, driven by fear to lock up a condition, long-term ignored problems. The condition requires healing, the right use of power, a vision and a plan, violence. This generation of youth have more guns for toys than televisions. Violence, AIDS, by and large the result of unloving, unguarded, undisciplined sex. Violence, abandoned border babies, young girls carrying a baby to term, check it in the hospital on the false name and address, checking out leaving the baby in the hospital to be raised by the state, to carry a baby in your body nine months to term, and drop that baby in the hospital as if it were a bowel movement and never look back, Something has died in you that's fundamental to your humanity. And young men surely must have a humane, ethical, value system to the firm, the human race of which you are a part. You're not a man just because you can make a baby. You're a man because you can raise a baby and love a baby and care for a baby.
you must give your offspring the dignity of your name. You have a high place in the natural order of things. Dogs raise their puppies. Cats raise their kittens. Cows raise their calves. Eagles protect little eaglets in the nest until they can fly. Surely we who are just a little less than God, just a, a little lower than the angels, must raise the babies we make to honor our place in the natural order. There's this burden to fight violence. Abandoning babies is a form of violence. By age 15, this generation has watched 18,000 hours of television. Listen to more than 22,000 hours of radio. The song aimed at youth 10 to 12 years old, songs like, You're Not Too Young to Try. And that's a generation of 27-year-old grandmothers. And 15-year-old boys meeting their 32-year-old dads in jail. Since boys tend to want to become like their daddies wherever they are. In jail, dead or alive. Compared with 11,000 hours of school. And less than 3,000 hours of church, temple, or synagogue. Quantitative by youth. The media has more access to the minds of our youth than home, church, and school combined and qualitatively penetrates more deeply. Those who have the most access to the minds of our children have the most responsibility. On TV when somebody is shot, it's a blank, it's ketchup, and credits roll. In real life, it's a bullet, it's blood, and consequences come. We must stop the violence and save our children. TV romanticizes violence. Record companies are selling it. I've talked with many young rap artists who have creative rap and rhythm and rhyme, and they can't get a contract in spite of talent and rapping and rhythm and rhyme, unless they say bitch and nigger and gone, they can't get a contract. From high up, they have been paid to spread decadence. And the lower they go, the higher the contract goes. There was a time when our values were stronger. We would not put dollars over dignity. Even this day, the record companies give out contracts for it. And the distributors hustle the labels. And this doctor's skin and grin and play it and turn their head the other way while the young die. Those who do it must not abuse your gifts, your dignity must never have a price tag on it and must be non-negotiable. Any record out that's degrading the race or religion or sex exploitation should be picketed and fought by the victims. You can't just stand idly by and play it and don't say it. You've got to stand up and fight back for dignity. Your lives are at stake. Much of the rapping is painful and ugly and sometimes violent. But rapping is not abstract. All too often it is, it is reflecting an ignored reality. No one likes to hear people talk about cop killer. Last year the press was reacting the IST and the rap about cop killer. And yet Terminator was out at the same time, the high-tech killing of cops. And when cops were killed high-tech, he was being invited to the White House to lead a national physical fitness campaign.
And while the high-tech killing of cops was Hollywood's fantasy last year, this year there's actual killing of the cops on the streets of L.A., the same place the movie was filmed. It's not just black rap artists. It's, it's Guns N' Roses wearing Manson t-shirts, glorifying the mass killer. It's this violent thing, this, this unresolved conflict. This inability to express ourselves without eliminating somebody. And it finds itself at every level of our language, whether it's sports writers talking about crushing a team or killing the opposition. It's just, it's just a sense of, of violence as if we are just locked in the limited language formations. I, I went to a church last Sunday, Sister Nancy, and, and the minister was performing the, the, the rites of infant baptism and the mother and father was there and the grandparents were there and the, and the godparents and relatives were there and after uh, that was a song and, and a prayer and he rubbed the little baby on the head and, and said prayers and lifted the little baby to God and they said this is a handsome little fella boy he's going to grow up one day and be a lady killer he's a handsome little fella he's going to grow up <laughs> and be a lady killer all the way up in the pulpit this violent language that manifests itself in these destructive, disruptive behavior patterns. At this stage, we're on the defensive as a struggle, as a humane struggle. Fear is pushing hope back. Cowardice is pushing courage back. Death is taking the joy of life. Dope is Outdistancing hope. Escapism is outdistancing embrace. When youth come alive, you have the energy, the strength, the need, and the moral authority to make America better and the whole world more secure. When young America comes alive, 1955, our country was mired deep in South African type racial separation. Rosa Parks, a young African American seamstress, refused to go to, to the back of the bus. Dr. King, a 26 year old graduate student, went to her rescue and said, Better that you walk in dignity than ride in shame. When young America comes alive, America gets better. 1964 students in Greensboro, North Carolina sat down to get hamburgers. They got handcuffs. They were threatened with expulsion from school because they broke out of the traditional order. They chose dignity over degrees and dollars. When young America came alive, they made America better. Rights that we all now take for granted did not come from the White House or the House, or Senate, or Supreme Court, when young America was sober and sane and sensitive with a, with a high moral agenda, young America made America better on this quest for the right to vote. <laughs> Swerner, Goodman, and Cheney, two Jews and a black, with the Philadelphia, Mississippi. They were scraped and bulldoze to death with their eyes wide open about the right to vote. Contrast mindless materialism with the willingness to die for the next generation. When young America came alive, they died that we might live for this right to vote. Jimmy Lee Jackson, young African-American student, was shot in the back and killed in cold blood for the right to vote. Violet Luizzo, an Italian-American mother from Detroit, Michigan, came south to help us. They called her nigger lover. Her brains were blown out point blank range for this right to vote. When young America came alive, Reverend James Reed, young white Unitarian minister, came south from Boston. Four babies blown up in the church and killed in Birmingham, Alabama, one Sunday morning. For this right to vote, when young America came alive, they began to march in Poland 
and they sang, We shall overcome. In Tiananmen Square, they sang, We shall overcome. In South Africa, they sang, We shall overcome. When young America chooses hope over dope and life over death, we have the power to transform the whole world when we come alive. When we come alive. We must break the cycle of moral degenerate behavior. This spiritual surrender, this ethical collapse, we must, we must go counterculture. We must lead the social values redemptive revolution. Or today I wish I could talk more about the real progressive challenges of our day. I would like to make a case for the plight of the family farmers, those who fed America and fed the world, now sometimes find themselves distressed, unemployed, disenfranchised on their own farms. Those who fed America and fed the world are now dying in the dark. I would like to talk more about that are the real ramifications of NAFTA. If we're not real careful, it's going to amount to a low-paying jobs bill for Mexico and a high-priced crime bill for our country. Unless we, in fact, build a bridge and not just have a cliff between the U.S. and our next-door neighbor. I believe in free trade and fair trade. I believe we should have a bridge built and not a cliff. Don't get angry with the Mexicans. They are not taking jobs from us. The corporate greedy are taking jobs to them to suppress our wages and to exploit them. I wish I could see your vitality, young America marching about a national, national health care plan. After all, nearly 40 million Americans have no health insurance. Don't color it black or color it brown on this poverty question. 40 million Americans and poverty, 29 million are white. Most black people are not poor. Most poor people are not black. Most poor people are white and female and young. But whether white, black, or brown, hunger hurts. When a mother's baby cries out at midnight because it went to bed supperless, it does not cry out in race or sex or, or religion. It cries out in pain. Somebody must address this poverty crisis. We should be marching today about these community development banks that were promised to us, or the need for adequate housing, or to fight malnutrition, or to discuss equal funding for, for public education. I really wish I could make that case today where teachers' pay go up and tuition costs come down. I wish I could focus on that today. Even the unfinished business of Haiti, or Somalia, or Bosnia, or China. I wish I could talk just a little bit more about the new world order that you must face. Whatever you think about NAFTA, it does distinguish, it does set up irreversibly a relationship with 90 million neighbors with whom we share 2,000 miles of border. Why must you get beyond your own race and your own language in the world in which you must live because half of all human beings are Asian half of them are Chinese America is one-third of this hemisphere North America two-thirds of our neighbors speak Spanish and Portuguese in the main English is a minority language in this hemisphere what I want to talk about multiculturalism one-eighth of the human race is African when Mr. Clinton We'll meet Mr. Yeltsin. Together they will represent one-eighth of the human race. I'm trying to say to you that most people in the world today are yellow, are brown, are black, are non-Christian, poor, female, young, and don't speak English. So when they meet, that will be a minority meeting. In your world, you must get bigger than dope and get bigger than guns onto the agenda of hope and building. You must get out of this rut and go to higher ground. There's a world out there awaiting for you. 
I'm often asked, who's going to lead this drive to break up the drugs and, and the violence? I am not given, number one, to looking for the easiest way out. Number one, while the media may project this as, as a rap issue or a black issue, the fact is it is an American problem with a black face on it. As you could tell by those of you who stood when I asked you questions about guns and, and violence and drugs. After all, this brothers killing brothers didn't start in Wichita. This didn't start in Kansas City. Remember Cain kill Abel? Brothers killing brothers? And, and they had a two-parent household, sociologists. And, and they didn't live in a housing project. But somehow, through all of that access, Cain did less than his best. And God gave him back in proportion to what he put up, not very much. He got mad at God, but jealous of Abel. He would not fight the source of his real concern. He killed his brother. Not based upon poverty, but based upon greed and fear and misdirected rage. As we fight this violent syndrome, as we fight this condition, we cannot just focus on poverty. There's a root here, a moral issue. There is here an ethical issue. Nobody has earned the right to kill or rob or rape anybody based upon not having some they think they need. Because you cannot get it by robbing and raping and killing. The victims must lead it. In New York a few days ago, Nearly 400 young blacks under age 21 have killed each other this year. If that many blacks have been killed by whites, there will be riots and sympathy riots everywhere. If that many whites have been killed by blacks, there will be calls for capital punishment everywhere. There will be so many electrocutions, you'd have to rent portable electric chairs. But because it's black on black, there's a kind of permissive zone. The blacks are less protected by law. Those who do the shooting will get less time for an egregious crime. In that zone, there's more killing and more liquor stores and more drugs and less training and more closed school and more abandoned housing. This is an American problem. In New York City, there are 600 young blacks, 13 and under, with the AIDS. When you add up the cost of those who were shot and died but received expensive trauma care, they received blood transfusions, they received the priority time of the doctors, add that cost of those who, shot, who were shot and died, and by and large, were buried without insurance. Add to that those 10 times more who were shot and didn't die. But now that the road mass is over, are carrying colostomy bags, or brain injury, or surgery, or spinal injury, or loss of limb, or debilitated, unable to protect their families and crippled for the rest of their lives. Add to that those who shot them who are now in jail. When you add those three costs together, it can bankrupt in the city, in the state, in the nation, multiply it time 100. Either we're going to drive drugs and guns and greed out, or greed and drugs and guns are going to drive us out. There can be no draft dodgers in this war as we fight crime and violence. <laughs> we 
Why is it such a priority beside the morality, the practical dimension? All of our hopes, our dreams, prenatal care, head start, daycare, vocational education, smaller teacher, student classroom ratio, better facilities, all of our great dreams. We would invest in education. We're throwing money at jails, but the jails are being crime driven. We must change the condition and change people's minds. In Washington, not long ago, a four-year-old child was shot, the 14-year-old was killed. I went to visit the child in the hospital. Lying there, four years old, innocent, never knew what hit her, perspiring, tubes in her nose and mouth, and mother clutching her hand and weeping, and grandmother weeping. The doctor pulled back the curtain and said, I've done all I can do. I can't thin the blood out. The clots are coming. I can't bring the high blood pressure down. The vessels are breaking. The baby is dying. We had prayer. The 14-year was already killed. Now, let's go deeper than that. The baby's mother had just turned 20, which means that she was 15 when she was pregnant, impregnated. Her daddy was killed when she was three. She never saw him. Her mother died last year at 37, overdose of drugs. Left her three brothers and sisters. Five of them living in one room without a telephone because at a young, tender, uneducated age, she cannot properly distribute that check. The baby's daddy couldn't come to the funeral because he's in the penitentiary. He shot a four-year-old child who was worse than dead, lifetime disability, brains shot. This may have been a, a problem. It is now a condition. It's our problem. Who gonna stop it? In a real sense, we keep looking for an outside in answer, a top down answer. We keep judging politicians by how tough they talk about it, how long they threaten to lock somebody else up about it. The reality is, you can't lock up a condition, you can't curse a condition, you can't threaten a condition. If the enemy was them over there in the brown shirt, we might could shoot the enemy. But them is in your house wearing a t-shirt. You can't shoot quite as quick. It's not them out yonder speaking another language. It's in this room among those that we love the most who are trapped now in the trade winds of our times. Who's going to break it up? Who's going to end it? We, we understand the problem and the plight. Now who's going to break it up? The victims must lead the social values redemptive revolution. Victims? Yes, victims. Victims have the most interest in ending the low hanging clouds of terrorism. Those who can't go to school without fear of their lives, who can't speak up in the classroom, those who can't teach because they're afraid their mother has a gun, those who can't go to the cafeteria, those who are afraid to walk from home to school in the morning or afternoon, but Reverend, it's, it's dangerous for the victims. It is. But there's reward on the other side of danger. After all, slaves, masters never retire. The slaves have to change their minds. The Bible says that we shall be transformed by the renewal of our minds. We got to change our minds about this situation. 
segregators never retire. The segregated must change their minds. The oppressed never retire. The oppressed must change their minds. Sex abusers will never tell it. The abused have to tell it. Those who perpetrate sexism will never get it unless the victims tell it. The victims must lead the drive. We must massively change our minds. There must be a countercultural values revolution. Kind of like we ain't going to take it no more. And, and it goes something like this, students, in your school. And I ask you the question, had you told somebody? And by and large, you said no. It means you're cooperating. I saw a generation of youth go to the back of the bus. And the sign said, colored seat from the rear, whites from the front. They just cooperated. Dr. King gave that speech in Washington in 1963. We who came from as far southwest as Texas, across to Florida, up to Virginia, we who are black or Hispanic, surname, or Native American, we could not use a single public toilet. And we learned to adjust. We went to the back of cars and trucks and trees and alleys and, and relieved our bodies. We learned to adjust. We were conditioned to humiliation. My dad was the veteran of a foreign war. Medals in the Bible and on the, the dresser drawer. Wounds in his, in his body. Didn't have the right to vote but had to pay taxes. He had been conditioned to it. But somebody, some victim, some Rosa Parks, some Swanner Goodman Cheney, some victim must change his or her mind. And when light appears, darkness will dash. The victims must change their minds. What can one person do? Turn out all the lights in this gymnasium and light one candle. Light will challenge darkness, but it must be lit. And each of us has a light within us. In your school, if there's only one security guard, somebody gets shot, a conservative remedy is we need five police. We need 10. A liberal reaction may be it just happened that time. More police, not less is the answer. Because as long as young girls are willing to bring drugs to school in their bra, and young men bring drugs in their shoes and guns in their back pockets, unless the victims change your minds, more or less police will not answer it because, because of the conspiracy of silence. If you are tired of being afraid to walk to school without fear, if you are tired of, of teaching in the classroom where you cannot demand discipline for fear of being shot, if you are aware of somebody who cannot afford to buy a book is driving a BMW and you know it's drug driven, you got to tell it. Where's the solution? A new attitude? A new behavior, a new character, a new national vision. Now what that really means is this. It means in your school, you don't have to be naive and jump up and say, my name is Joe and Robert has a gun. That is naive. Because Robert is a little junior terrorist. And he has been taught to shoot people who upset his market. But there are, there are other ways to do that. If your value system says he shouldn't have the gun, you can tell the principal. 
You can tell the, the teacher. You can tell your pastor. You have no moral obligation to be silent about knowing those who carry guns or drugs. But Reverend, uh, that's dishonorable. Is, is, is that snitching? No. There's a, a difference between snitching and self-defense and self-respect. If you and I are talking and, and you share with me some private personal concern, some trouble you're having, some trial you're going through, and I go and tell somebody else, that's dishonorable. I snitched on you. I exposed your secret, and now you're vulnerable. You could get hurt. That's snitching. That's dishonorable. On the other hand, if I know you got crack or cocaine or heroin and a gun, we're not bonded on that proposition. And then somebody else has crack, a heroin, and a gun, and they're coming to collect. Or you are going to collect. I may not even be involved, but I can be killed in the crossfire of bullets. I have a self-determination moral obligation, the same obligation with which I would feel an if I knew somebody had a sheet or hood or rope in their locker, I would tell that. We lose more young black lives annually to drugs than the sum total of lynchings in the history of the country. We must deal with death by character, not by color. By ethics, not by ethnicity. Stop the killing everywhere. Save all of God's children. That's our burden. That's our moral obligation. And this thing comes down to character. How do you find, define that special something, Mr. President, called character? Jesus chose not to give a, a dictionary definition. He said, try it this way. He said, one day a man was walking down the street tending to his business. And two thieves came from some place and robbed him and beat him and left him bleeding to die. Now today's television would probably take the beaten man and make him a hero. Say, look at his blood. Look at his nose broke. Look at his blue eye. Look at his black eye. They would make the beaten man a hero. He was no hero. He was just a victim. He said, I shall judge heroes and heroism and sheroism by how you respond to a beaten man. He said, so one man came down the street, a reverend, a rabbi, a man of God, a man of religion, a man of organized institutional religion. He saw a man lying there bleeding to death and Reb went to the other side of the street, prayer book in one hand, Bible in the other, singing the songs of Zion. Heaven bound, no earthly good. He says one kind of character. He said another man came on the street of, of his own race, as in my brother. And he left and went to the other side of the street also. He said now another man came down the street of a different race and a different religion and a different culture. And he stopped and helped him on his way. He said, he said that, that's that character thing. Well, is that some abstract thing in yesterday that you could not have here in Manhattan? I think not. Last year, Rodney King was beaten nearly to death by four white policemen. It was a racist act. And people called it that. But don't conclude all whites are racist on that basis. Because had not George Halliday, a white photographer, filmed it and took it public, you would never know Rodney King ever existed. George Halliday went beyond color. He went beyond culture. He went up to character. I don't see schools giving him honorary degrees and an authentic expression of character under pressure. He could have kept that film for whole movies and just been a mean person. He did us a public good. On the other hand, you saw four young blacks beat Reginald Denton nearly to death, broke a block on his head. And Mr. Bush was quick to say that these were thugs who beat this man, trying to appeal to fear to get a few more votes. 
The other part that was not discussed, however, was that four young blacks in four different homes saw it take place and they left their home, four different homes, and saved him from them and took him to the hospital and the black doctor did surgery on Reginald Denny. Beyond color and culture is something called character. I suppose what's different generation 1993 than years past Whenever we've had to fight these battles, we've always needed to change some law. Go to the state capitol, change the law. Go to Washington, change the law. But I submit to you, between now and, and January 2nd, there'll be a rise in dope distribution, alcohol consumption, gun purchases, and killing. We have the power right now. Without changing another law, we have the power right now to stop killing each other. We have the power right now to turn to each other and not on each other. We have the power right now to give our babies the dignity of our names. We have the power right now to not engage in Unloving sex without love, making unwanted babies. We have the power right now to register and vote. We have the power right now to build more schools and fewer jails. We have the power right now to make America better. You have the power. Use your mind. Use your body. Use your spirit. Assert your character. It's your choice, your consequence, your challenge, your opportunity, your hope. God bless you. Keep hope alive. Thank you very much for coming. God bless you. Thank you very much.